You're good to go. Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I am, first of all, would like to apologize to those of you who joined the live webinar for our technical problems, and hopefully today we will not have any of those and get through this recording. And I want to thank those of you who are just here for the first time and welcome. And before I get started, I really want to say thank you to Nicole from NAFCC for her support and with all of the logistics. So today, um, we're going to be talking about dual language learners. And I am really excited. This is one of my favorite topics. And I just wanted to kind of start by talking about um, the fact that this is something, this, is, this presentation is very basic. It's kind of an introduction for those of you who are just beginning to think about this. And um, for those of you who are curious uh, about this population of children, and um, so we're not really going to go very deep into anything, but I hope that you leave with some, at least some really interesting questions. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not here to answer too many questions today. I'm mostly here to uh, engage your thinking on this topic. So um, I wanted to talk to you about some of the objectives that I have for us today, and I want to um, go over them with you. So I, part of what I'd like to do today is challenge your myths and values around bilingualism. I want you to have a better grasp on the cognitive advantages of knowing more than one language. And I want you to reflect on, on this and have begin to ask yourself some uh, deeper questions about your own um, values and beliefs around language. And as I said before, I really want you to leave with more questions and answers. So what we're going to be talking about today are children who are growing up with more than one language. Um, these are terms that have been used throughout um, you know, history, not, not, the, not a very long history. but And these terms kind of all mean the same thing. But if you really um, think about it, they all have some value in, in kind of embedded in the term. So bilingual is simply knowing two tongues, knowing two languages. Limited English proficiency is a term that was used, I would say, probably in the 90s, mostly. Many people still use it. And um, there's nothing wrong with it, except that it seems to, in my opinion, give a sense of like a deficit. So um, if you're limited in English, then you, there, there's some, like a little bit of a deficit implied in that terminology. Um, then we started using uh, English language learners, which is, again, nothing wrong with that term. I think most of you are probably using this term. Um, and it just means that you are in the process of learning English. But again, for those of us who are advocates of, of this population of children and families, um, it kind of places a lot of emphasis on English. And it doesn't really acknowledge the fact that the children have another language. So this term, dual language learners, has been used more recently. And I think um, it began probably uh, with Head Start. And um, I like this term because dual language learners sort of acknowledges the fact that children are learning two languages simultaneously. And for those of you who are working with young children zero to five, that is the most appropriate term for uh, this type of children because they are actually learning two languages. Whether we want to acknowledge it or not, they are learning English more, more likely uh, in school, but they are also speaking in another language at home. So I think that this term, dual language learner, simply acknowledges that. Now, if you were to leave the United States and went and presented on this topic anywhere else in the world, the term bilingual is a term that is most used throughout the world. And there's, I think um, in, this, in our country, there seems to be kind of a lot of um, political weight on some of these terms. And so 
we have moved away from bilingual, but, I, but it is truly the most appropriate term. So um, this issue of bilingualism or knowing more than one language is something that our nation has been grappling with for many, many generations, probably from the beginning of our country's um, creation. And as uh, President Kennedy said, every American who has ever lived, with the exception of one group, and I'm sure he was referring to Native Americans, was either an immigrant himself or the descendant of immigrants. So I think this is something that currently there's a lot of um, heat around the, the, this idea of immigration. And, um, but this is a, a real fact. The fact is that there is no such thing as an American who is not a descendant of another immigrant. So um, this is something that all immigrants from the beginning of time have been battling with. So I was recently in New York and I went for the first time to the Statue of Liberty and I was really moved by the just the sense of all the languages that Lady Liberty has encountered in, in since her existence. And I love this quote that I found in the museum there that said, once the pedestal was completed in 1886, the statue was reassembled with surprising speed by a fearless construction crew, many of whom were new immigrants. So again, this is just sort of to kind of um, place ourselves in some little bit of a historical context in uh, regarding language and the history of our country. Um, so, Many of you, you know, when I make this presentation at conferences, I know that the most of the concerns, and I've heard all of these, these are the top three concerns that I hear about when we talk about this. And um, the, so this, I, the sense that I don't have the capacity, I don't speak another language, so how can I help children who are, who are coming with other languages? There's another concern, which is that there's so many languages, I can't accommodate everyone. And then another concern or another comment that I hear is show me a bilingual program that actually works. And these are, I hear this from teachers, I hear this from administrators, I hear this from superintendents. So these three, I hear, you know, these three themes kind of always emerge. And I think, I hope that we can sort of talk a little bit about that in today's presentation and address a little bit of, of that because I want us to go deeper than this. And I want us to go a little bit beyond these concerns. Although I recognize that they're very real concerns, I think we need to go a little bit deeper. So, um, and the reason for that is because the truth is that most of you, you know, and, and I'm, I know this is not a live presentation, but many of you are probably already beginning to see um, dual language learners in your program. And this is something that's happening nationwide. And there's several studies that show that most teachers have, yeah, you know, I think it's like 80, think 86% of teachers in, the, in our country have at least one um, dual language learner or ELL um, in their program. So this is a, 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 a population of children that we are all having to begin to deal with. And, and, and depending on where you live, in, you know, if you're in California, there's a great chance that you're very, probably most of the kids in your program are DLLs. If you're in Alabama, maybe you're starting to see this. So um, depending on where you are, um, the population is changing, but definitely um, it's something we're all across the country beginning to feel and see. So what are some of the values and myths? And I think it's important to talk about that to, to start off because historically in our country, we have equated language, the English language, with being American. So in order for us to be a full-fledged American, we must speak English, which I think is actually quite valid and very real. And, um, but then we're also equating it with being patriotic. And so I, I hear a lot of a language that suggests that if you don't speak English, you're somehow betraying um, your country. Or if you speak more than one language, you are not fully American. I think there's also historically been a subtractive policy versus an additive policy. And that just means that 
historically our education policy has been around subtracting, removing, or eliminating the other language as opposed to adding English to another language. So our policies and the, 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 these policies are primarily applied to low-income children. Also, in, in often, and I still hear this, uh, you know, in my travels, is that sometimes people almost consider coming children that are coming in with another language as the, as if they had a deficit or a disability. And there are actually many studies that suggest that often children with another language get over identified as having a language delay or a language deficit. And another myth, I think, is that there is, um, that knowing more than one language or young children who are learning more than one language or some could get confused. And so in, with very good intentions, our tendency is to um, discourage them from speaking their home language and we want them to really focus on learning English. So these are, I would say uh, very strong values that we hold in our country and, and some myths because there's really no evidence um, that shows that knowing more than one language is in any way a deficit, a disability, or that it confuses children. Um, so, but um, I would like to suggest to you that these values are values that we might need to rethink because our world is changing at a very fast pace and in very significant ways, and language is becoming something different. So we are shrinking, you know, uh, through technology and communication, we are uh, able to travel, you know, um, faster, we are able to travel more widely, we're in, in not only uh, travel physically, but from, from our home, we can be in many places at once through technology. And I also wanted to um, point out to you a couple of interesting things, which are one I pulled out of the Department of Defense website, and it's this quote that's um, on, uh, these are uh, some fellowships that are, um, are awarded through the Department of Defense, and it says that they are awarded to U.S. graduate students who develop independent projects that combine study of language and culture in, critical, in areas critical to national security. So here we're starting to talk about language as something that is really relevant to our national security. So not only is it patriotic to speak another language, it's actually something that we are, we are desperately in need of in order to protect ourselves, our country. The second way I would like you to kind of consider language is that in terms of our ability to compete, the promotion of foreign language instruction should be a national priority. In an increasing competitive international economy, a workforce with more market-relevant foreign language skills is a strategic economic asset for the United States. This is out of the Council on Foreign Relations. And again, we're thinking about language here as a strategic asset. So I also included here um, a little um, YouTube video, which I cannot show in this recording, but I hope that you, I will send you the links to all of the videos in the presentation. And this is Mark Zuckerberg, the founder of Facebook, who is married to a Chinese woman and who gave a presentation, uh, a fairly long, I think it was like 45 minute presentation in Mandarin at a very important conference at the, like the, the Harvard of China. And uh, he was kind of made fun of and criticized because his accent wasn't very good, but I feel like this is really important. If, if somebody like Mark Zuckerberg thinks that knowing another language or being able to communicate, or he's trying to communi communicate in another language, then I think we need to pay attention because as you know, Facebook has really changed the world. I also wanted to point your attention to something that I think is really quite fascinating, which is the second language acquisition industry in our country. It is a $40.3 billion market worldwide, and the United States is the second largest market. 
which kind of challenges this notion that many of us in our country have, which is that, oh, well, I just, you know, everybody needs to know English. As long as I know English, I'll be, able, I'll be fine. And I think that that's kind of, uh, this, this day, the statistic here sort of challenges that idea because if the United States is the second largest market, that means that the United States, the population of the United States is trying to learn another language. And as you might all be familiar with um, companies like Rosetta Stone, and then we have these two uh, apps that are quite popular, Duolingo and Babbel. And the projected growth uh, of this whole industry is that it is going to continue to grow another $5 billion in the, in the next few years, a couple of years. So, so what this says to me is that we need to rethink our stance and our values in terms of subtracting language and maybe starting to think more of adding language as opposed, you know, and, and really valuing this um, children who have another language by, the, by birth. So in terms of this competitiveness, I think we also need to point out that about 50% of the earth is bilingual. There are about 6,000 languages spoken across the world. Um, but there are really some kind of fundamental languages that are unite even countries where there are many languages. So Arabic, Bengali, English, French, Hindi, Malay, Mandarin, Portuguese, Russian, and Spanish. Um, so if we think of that, then I really think that maintaining our stance on, be, on continuing to be one of the few industrialized countries that is monolingual, officially monolingual, then we're, I just wanted to sort of use an image of, in terms of uh, how kind of a metaphor. So being monolingual is kind of insisting on using this dialing, dial-up phone as opposed to using these new technologies like what we're using at this moment to record this presentation. So imagine continue insisting on using this type of phone. How would you do a, a teleconference? How would you, um, you know, run your business and run your, your programs as you're doing right now with, with this type of technology? And kind of the same thing with using a steam engine as opposed to a high-speed train. So I just think that we need to, I'm proposing that we start to think about language more as something that is gonna take us into the future and keep us uh, competitive. So aside from the economic and kind of national security um, advantages of language, one of the other things that has changed our world is recent uh, brain science and, 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 and what brain science has begun to show us about the brain of bilingual people. So there are many studies, and again, as I said, we're going to stay quite um, on the surface of this. We could spend um, many years just on this one topic, but there is evidence that bilingualism prevents dementia. It supports uh, the ability to focus on tasks, and I think uh, that is because as people switch between languages, it literally strengthens the executive function, the part of the brain that is in charge of executive function. There's also evidence that because the brain seems to have to work a little harder, then it actually makes the gray matter denser. And um, there's also evidence that it supports improvement of memory and decision-making skills. And I think that has to do with, um, again, with this idea of switching back and forth. So, and of course, we, we, we can think of all the cultural and social advantages of knowing more than one language, but I really think it's important for us to focus on brain development and what, how we can support um, the, the brain. The title of this presentation, Two Languages, Two Brains, comes out of research on young children that almost shows as though they seem to develop almost like a parallel brain in terms of their um, switching back and forth language. So um, although it might be a little exaggerated to say that knowing more than lang one language gives you a second brain, it does, there's some evidence that it, it sort of, um, they're, they're kind of like a two images, two, two, two elements inside the brain that um, the child develops and uh, uses for language. 
this is a really nice video that again i am not going to be able to show you but i really like it because it gives you a very nice synopsis of what are some of the advantages of bi being bilingual and what are some of the types of bilingual um, people so they in this video they'll they talk about a family with a young uh, a family that comes to this country and there's a little girl and a teenager and the parents and each of those three um, types of bilingual the, the little girl who is going to be learning both languages at once the adolescent who is going to be learning uh, language when he's you know still in the process of, of um, learning and then the two adults who um, learn who learn um, who learn this other language so unfortunately I won't be able to show you that but you know, this is a nice video for you to look at on your own. So why do we need to focus on this population of children, as, as I said in the beginning? Well, as, I, as we talked very briefly, there is a demographic imperative, which just simply means that as this population of children continues to grow, and they are the fastest growing group in our country, um, then we have kind of, we have to take a pause and, and think about how we're going to uh, work with these kids and what are their special and very unique language and literacy needs. I think it's also an issue of equity and social justice. I think it's an issue of really thinking about how language can be an asset that can be used towards their school readiness. I think it's, um, as we also have to think about accountability and um, how uh, these young children are faring inside our communities. And one of the greatest challenges is the alignment of standards. As, as many of you may have begun to, to see, there is a, a push at a national level to um, integrate standards. And QIRS in many states is kind of an opportunity for um, early childhood communities to look at that. And the reason why this is going to be an interesting issue, especially if, you're, if your community is aligning standards is that um, Head Start, and we'll see this a little bit later, has had historically some really strong standards around home language. So, as I said, there are some, our country's changing very fast, and so the population of children who are uh, entering school with more than one language has grown by about 40% in the last 10 years. And the population of children, or the, the population, this population of um, dual language learners is not happening only in the states where we would expect, like California, New York, Florida, but it's actually happening in other parts of our country very fast, like in the South, like in Alabama, South Carolina, Tennessee. Even though these populations are still quite small, the percentage and the rate of growth is quite fast. So again, this is touching everyone, and we all are going to um, most more than likely have a child in our program, and we're going to have to think about ways in which we can support them. And as you know, as I said uh, earlier, we are uh, a lot of us in our in our, the early childhood community are looking at how we can align systems and standards. And so, the more we move forward with this, the more we're going to have to think about language. So, in general, there are four types of ELL or English language learner programs. And um, I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with all of these, but I just wanted to kind of highlight them. So there's one language, one type, which is where, let's say, a Spanish-speaking child would come and only speak Spanish in a, a school. That is quite rare in this country, but more and more there are immersion programs that are popping up all over the country, and parents seem to be really interested in this. And so uh, even though it's rare, it's, I think it's growing. There's also something called transitional bilingual, where maybe the child is exposed to their home language, or L1. L1 is, is, is a, kind of the, the scientific way of referring to home language. Um, so, and there are some programs like this, where the, in the beginning the child is, introduced, is um, used, Spanish is used, and then they are slowly 
moved into English. There are other, there's another type of bilingual program, which is called two-way bilingual, which means that maybe half of the day is in one language, half of the day is in another language. This is, again, still somewhat rare in our country, but you are seeing more and more of this all over, and there are jurisdictions across the country where we're seeing a lot of um, parents really wanting this type of program. And then the most, the most common form of, of uh, English language program is English only, meaning that the child is really expected to immediately adapt and learn English and their home language is really not um, used or, or talked about or considered at all in, in, in their program. Um, and so uh, in, like, um, the outcome of that is that the L1 tends to wither and there's, it's never developed. And that's kind of that subtractive policy I talked about earlier. So this is something that uh, has implications. All of these models have implications. And I think it's important for us to recognize what those implications are. Um, and um, one of those implications in this, um, particularly in the English only model, is that what happens to that child by the time he's in third grade and has no, has lost his Spanish and his parents have not learned English, you are creating families that cannot speak to each other. And this is something that I see a lot and it's quite concerning. Um, so, but, but the majority of us are in this kind of English only space. And so that's where you get these concerns of, well, well how can I help? This, these kids if I don't even know another language or if no one, I'm not being supported in, in how I can support the kids. And so I hope that today I offer you a couple of little insights into things that you can do. And, um, you know, there are many, most, most people that I talk to have, have a kind of a little bit of an anxiety about this. And so I think the first thing we need to do is think about language as a gift. And I think we need to unpack it, meaning that I think we need to know, like really get deeper into what we know about language acquisition and what do we know about the connection between language and learning. So I wanted to just kind of go back a little bit into your, um, you know, if you've taken a class on um, learning theory and kind of remind you of some of, of the most basic theories of learning. So one of the fathers of education psychology is uh, Bandura. He's an American um, psychologist, socio-educator from California. And he was one of the first to write and study what is known, what he referred to as self-efficacy. Self, and he's kind of the father of socio-cognitive um, theory of learning. And he believed that learning occurs it's the interaction between your own personal factors, what you bring to the table, the, the, your, the, behavior, the environment that you come into, let's imagine a classroom, and how those two things interact to create a certain behavior. And then it becomes like the circle of, of, um, of um, connection between all these three things. And learning occurs as those three things happen. But at the core of that is your own belief and your own sense of your, your identity as a learner or your, self, your sense of self-efficacy, as he called it. And self-efficacy, underlying self-efficacy is this idea of motivation, perseverance, grit, your ability to, to, to endure challenges, to want to take on challenges, and whether or not you avoid certain challenges. And so we know now that one of the most important things that children need in order to really advance in their academic lives is, are these things that are sort of these soft skills, you might call them, although they, they seem to be central to learning, which is this idea of motivation and perseverance. And at the core of that is this, the identity that the child has as a learner. And that identity can be compromised if the child feels that somehow they are flawed or there's something deficient about them. And that can really under, undermine 
their sense of themselves as learners, and that can have implications that are really serious for the long for their long um, term academic careers. And I always like to use an example of this that has nothing to do with specifically with language, but it has to do with kind of the way a child sees the world and what he brings to the world or she brings to the world. So this personal, this idea of a per, your personal factors, like what do you bring to the table? And so if we think about this, was, uh, this example was um, shared with me by one of my first psychology teachers when I was in an undergrad, and it kind of um, stayed with me. And it had to do with an intelligence test that was offered where children had to, the, the challenge that children had to answer was, if you're playing baseball in a field and you lose your ball, how do you begin to look for it? And the correct answer was that the child would have to some, somehow suggest that there had to be kind of a zigzag across the field and that that's how it, the children would go about finding the ball. So that was like the correct answer. But then there were these children that were circling, writing these circles on the pages, and nobody understood what this was all about. But then when they looked at the area of the country where the kids, the ones that were doing this, where they were coming from, well, they were coming from the mountains of West Virginia, in the Appalachian Mountains. And so why were they doing this? Well, because in the mountain, if you're playing ball and you lose your, your, your baseball, the most logical thing to do would be to go around trees and see if your ball got stuck in the in the you know in the stump of the tree or in the trunk of the tree at the bottom of the tree. And so this to me seems like a really interesting and fun creative response to a simple question. But this answer in this intelligence test was marked wrong. It the only correct answer was some variation of this. So I, and that, to me, that just said, like, how do, how, how, what are we saying to these children? We're saying that they're not intelligent because they had another very creative way of answering this simple question. So I thought, well, this kind of has a lot of relevance to the way I think sometimes, sometimes we treat um, children that come into school with another language. We don't value their context and we don't value their experience. We treat them like they're a blank slate, but in reality, they bring a lot to the table, and we just need to understand it and value it and not mark it as wrong. Um, and this brings me to another very important um, kind of a father of, of education, which is um, Vygotsky. He was a Russian um, psychologist, and he's considered the father of constructivism which is another theory of learning. And he talked about the importance of, of language and culture as being the two most important tools that people use in their learning process. And that learning really only can occur when you bring whatever, you, whatever prior knowledge or prior experience you have that is then used to scaffold to build the next level of learning and that through this process of building on prior knowledge and then scaffolding it to a next level we obtain mastery but imagine if that if we ignore that there is this child who brings this other language and their culture in the context of that how are we by ignoring that we're not building on their prior knowledge we're not helping them scaffold and we're not allowing them to build mastery through these two tools and so we're missing some really very very important opportunities for learning and for building the child's sense of, of themselves as a learner or their self-efficacy so i think we need to be careful very careful about how we treat home language and another thing to really point out, you know, this is a very simplified um, brain uh, diagram, but it's just important to remind ourselves that language is language, okay? There's no like English language side of the brain and other side. No, language is language. So if you know language, then that language can be transferred to a new language. There are some essential structures in your brain that once you learn, you can't unlearn. Once you learn to read, 
once you learn to speak, no matter what language, you can't unlearn it unless, of course, you have some kind of accident and have brain damage. But in general, there's no such thing as unlearning language. So just keeping, um, keeping that in mind as we um, think about how we can support young children who are learning another language at home. So this idea of kind of mastery and scaffolding kind of is, is one of the, in terms of those of us who work in um, with dual language learners, this idea of literacy transfer is really important. And there's research that backs this up that shows that some of the things that can be transferred from one language to another are these types of things, things like activation of semantic knowledge. That just means very simply, this is a fancy way of saying that if you know the meaning of something in, in one language, you can transfer that to another language. And here I'm going to give you an example of another story which was told to me by a teacher who was one of my children's teacher. And she, I was fortunate enough to, to, my children did attend one of those rare immersion programs. And she, they had a bilingual teacher and they were um, doing the kindergarten entry exams for um, the for kids coming into the school system, and the, she was asked to evaluate the children, but the children were only evaluated in Spanish. In, pardon me, in English. And there was a simple, you know, one of the little areas of testing was for children to identify a rooster, and they had to say the teacher would ask, "Well, what does this what does this teacher say?" and um, the what does the rooster say? And the children were supposed to answer cock a doodle doo, which is in the English version of what a rooster says. But then there were all these little kids who were Hispanic yelling out kikiriki, which is what in Spanish we say uh, roosters say. And she would have to mark the child as wrong because, you know, like X, because this was not an admissible answer. And again, this was kind of going back to that intelligence test. We are denying the fact that this child had semantic knowledge. He knew or she knew what this rooster was. She or he knew that the rooster made a specific sound. But that, that this was all kind of not taken into account, and we were only recognizing this. And so in a way, we were sort of, um, not in a way, in fact, in many states, we're only testing children in English, and so children who bring another set of concepts in their home language are they're not being recognized and they're being sort of labeled as not having any language and we often use language testing um, and what we're really testing is English language you know not just language in general so this again these are very important differences that, that we need to start to think about Another thing that children can bring, even if they speak another language, is text structure. That means that children who have been read to or, or talked to in another language have a sense of things like pauses, capital letters, if, if you are that advanced, you know, but language has a structure and a cadence. So they know that they, they have a sense of this and that can be transferred. Um, they can also use cues to predict meaning, and this is kind of how when um, rhymes and riddles and things like that have, have meaning. And most families and most children have been exposed to some type of little um, nursery rhyme or riddle in their home language, and so these can all be used to predict meaning. And of course, knowing and being aware of reading and writing just because they, they've seen other um, there are the, the adults in their life reading or writing, and they know that what it's for. Um, and so these are all things that can be transferred. Um, but again, probably to me, one of the most important things that can be transferred in, in, in when you know one language and you're moving to a second language is that this idea of, again, self-efficacy, the confidence in your learning identity, believing that you're a learner, liking the learning, being engaged in learning, but all of this can be unintentionally undermined when we start by oh, kind of open up their school experience by saying you're not allowed to speak here in Spanish or, or Urdu or whatever your home language is, and here we only speak in English. Imagine what kind of um, how that might feel to a three or four or a four year old. 
um, and then going home and being embarrassed by by who by who he or she is. Like really, we're kind of getting at the core of who that child is. And so that's another thing we need to always remind ourselves that language and culture and identity are all almost the same thing. And so when we attack one, we're kind of attacking everything. So um, being very mindful of that. So what are some of the things we can do? Again, inside, within our English only classroom context, what can we do so that we don't undermine this, this idea or at least we can be, be more mindful of it? I think one of the key things is to never say to a child that they can't speak in their home language. On the contrary, we should encourage them to speak in their home language. And of course, we want them to learn English, but we should not, not say to them, be care there's a difference in between saying we want you to learn English and we don't want you to learn English only. Those are two very different messages. And so I think we need to be thoughtful and careful about that. We have to think about how we are assessing children. And I think we and I touched on that with the rooster example. And what are we telling families? You know, I think this is one of those areas where families can play such a crucial role. And um, and I think we also need to be thinking about how, what are we saying about knowing more than one language overall as a value? This is not a, something we should be thinking about just for ELL communities. We should be thinking maybe about language and second and even third languages for all children as a, as a kind of as a brain um, stimulation tool. So not limiting ourselves. Um, what are some of the positive things we can begin to say that support this idea of self-efficacy and the uh, learner identity? Well, we can start to say to say to children that bilingualism is an asset, that, we, that we're proud of them for knowing another language. This is a great thing that they have, that, they're, that they, are, they bring something very special, that language is a bridge. It's something that, we, that opens doors. It's an advantage and a tool. We can even say that it's a necessity and a priority based on what we talked about earlier in terms of um, patriotism and economic competitiveness. And then maybe what we should be thinking about now is that my multilingualism is for all children. It's not just for a small group of children or, or actually a, a growing group of children. It should be for everyone. I happen to live in a county in Maryland that is very diverse, very multilingual. And the, the waiting list for the immersion programs, and there are several bilingual, full immersion and um, two-way immersion, uh, which I, we talked about earlier, the waiting list on, for these schools is vast. It's not only Hispanic and foreign-born parents trying to get their kids in there. It's all parents of every nationality and background and race trying to get their children into bilingual programs because I think parents are becoming more and more aware of what the advantages of uh, brain advantages are, and so they want that for their kids. I think we all need to have a toolbox it's not fair for teachers who are beginning to work with this population of children to have absolutely no help with and no knowledge about what to do with this with this very special gift, as we said. So I think I'd like to refer you to the Head Start website, which I think has one of the most wonderful kind of entry into this world of uh, culture and language. And if you visit their website, this is a place where you can really begin to go re very deep into this and learn about um, all kinds of strategies, a plan language approach, how to work with families. How is this, there are resources here for administrators, for teachers, for families. There's a lot of uh, data and research and information. So if you're not familiar with this, I encourage you. And I think sometimes family talk care providers are kind of not aware of some of these resources. And so I hope that um, you guys visit this amazing uh, resource, and I think this is a toolkit where you can begin to learn. They even have videos that show you kind of mod that model strategies that you can use with uh, families and children. So this is a wonderful resource, and it's kind of an entry gateway into a whole world of, of language and culture. And, you know, I think we all need to begin to uh, focus on 
how to address the needs of these children. I cannot cover everything that we can and should do in, in a short presentation. That's why I just wanted to kind of give you a taste of some of the things I hope you can think about in, in different ways. And one of the, the strategies that I highly recommend is that you, if you have more than one child in your program or just one child, you should begin to think about this. You should begin to focus on this challenge. You need to admit to your limitations and biases. We all have biases and we all have limitations in this sense of I can't help children because I don't know their language um, is something that is very valid. And I think it's, it's um, you know, I, I, re I understand how, why parent, you know, teachers feel unequipped. But I think it's important for you to be aware of those biases and your limitations, but I think we need to be, be move beyond that you know, as well. So there's lots of interesting questions that you need to ask yourself. And I, I would recommend that you join a group. You know, maybe you can ask your local R&R &R to set up a group, a work group, a study group. Maybe you, if you belong to the, your local family child care association, maybe this is something you might want to bring up to them and ask them to, at their next conference, offer courses or workshops on this. Um, whenever you have a chance, uh, and if you're able to, maybe uh, through a collaborative, you can bring in an expert and really get deeper into some of what we started to talk about here and, and, and maybe buy a couple of books and, and study them together. So this is something that um, you should, I hope today is the beginning of something, uh, a, new, a new learning path that you can do with a community of learning or a community of practice. Um, I want to kind of end by talking to you, directing you to this woman. Her name is Carol Dweck. She is the author of a uh, a kind of a theory called the growth mindset, which I'm, many of you may have already been um, talking about and, listen, and hearing about. This is a very short interview that she did with the founder of the Khan Academy, which is that free online um, learning um, platform. And he, this is a really lovely interview between the two of them, and she explains what the psychology of success is. In fact, Carol Dweck was a a student of Bandura's, and she um, kind of translated some of this this idea of self-efficacy into this uh, uh, something that she calls the psychology of success or growth mindset. And this has to do with how we message what we say to children about their potential and their abilities, and how we can support their their the child developing a sense of having a growth mindset and not a, a, a limited mindset. And she, in this video, talks about some very elemental, simple messages that we need to say to kids. And I highly recommend her books. She's written several books. And there's one really interesting study that she did, one of the first studies that she published, and it was a, where they went into a school uh, where there were low-income um, children. And they essentially told the kids, they randomly selected a group of kids, and they told them that they had um, special abilities and that they um, were going to be, you know, they were going to work with them one-on-one -on -one and do something very special with them. And in fact, there was nothing unique. I mean, they had not tested or done anything to, to identify these kids as having anything special. They just told them they were. And... Um, the teachers believed that these kids had a high potential because of this, this message that was delivered. And at the end of the year, the kids who had been told that this were, were performing at a higher rate than the ones who had not been told this. So this very simple messages and the way we approach children can really have some fundamental um, impact, again, on their self efficacy and their idea, their own sense of themselves as a learner. And I think um, this is very important for all of us as teachers to think about and keep in mind. Um, so I think children's um, DLLs should have images of other DLLs that have risen literally to the stars. And I put um, these two pictures. These are two Hispanic 
uh, astronauts who have, who both grew up um, in worlds where maybe they had uh, not been encouraged to speak another language, but they were able to reach for the stars and, and achieve a great deal. And I think that, you know, we need to give children this, this, this sense of their own ability and surround them with images of people like them who have reached uh, wonderful levels. And I wanted to kind of think about, leave you with a really uh, interesting concept, which is that when there was this one person that we all know who came from a faraway land, who had to escape the destruction of his people, who was welcomed in this country by kind strangers, who they gave him loving care, and who were very different to him, but they were they were very accepting of him and his culture. And they gave him the opportunity to realize his fullest potential on his own terms. And this person we all know was Superman. And so what would happen if we start to message and to give families and children a sense of themselves as having a superpower? That instead of a deficit and something to be concerned about the fact that they know another language gives them a special edge or a special advantage. And um, this quote is by Gatsky said that the way we talk to our children becomes their inner voice. So in conclusion, I just, you know, I wanted to just share with you that even if you're in an English only world, in an English only classroom, you can still provide children who are coming with another language some very important messages in a very important context for their capacity to develop and their own sense of themselves as a learner. So I hope that this um, short presentation gives you some, again, some things to think about, some challenges to conquer, um, some ideas for how you can support kids and um, and ways in which you can support yourself and your and your, your fellow teachers and create um, a group where you can all learn together. So thank you so much for your time. I know this was not a live presentation, so I want you to feel free to reach out to me directly. Here's my contact information. Or through Nicole and the NAFCC, um, I'm happy to respond to your questions as, as best as I can and refer you to uh, resources and literature if you want me to. And if you um, guys like this topic and you want to know more, we, you know, I'd love to um, talk to NASCC about doing more of these and maybe going a little bit deeper and bringing other experts that can um, help us um, with this very interesting challenge that many of us are facing. So thank you so much. And I really, again, want to thank Nicole and NASCC for giving me this opportunity. And I look forward to talking to all of you in the near future. Thank you so much.